there is one thing that I learned this year is not to underestimate the power of tiny things. Viruses are not even alive and they're like less than 800 nanometers in size, which means that they are very, very small, but they could still change the world, literally. Now, I know that everybody is tired of COVID-19, so I won't be talking about that topic. I just wanted to introduce you into the microscopic world, which also includes bacteria and the cells that make you and me up. Now, I assure you that by the end of this video, you'll be surprised of what microbes can do inside of our bodies. Because yes, there are not millions nor billions, but actually trillions of microbes inside of our bodies right now. And actually, the craziest thing is that we wouldn't be able to do a lot of things without these guys. This is why in synthetic biology, we are looking to leverage the power of our microbiome to do amazing things. Let's get started. So what exactly is the microbiome? I describe it as the community, the group of fungi, bacteria, archaea, and other types of microorganisms that live inside of a host. This host can be either a human, a mouse, or other types of organisms. Now there are three different kinds of relations that we can have with our microbes. One of them is symbiotic. This means that you've found a good relationship between, for example, your gut and your microbes. This means that they may be helping you digest some things that you wouldn't be able to process otherwise, and they're getting the nutrients in exchange. The other type is neutral. They're not good nor bad, self-explanatory. And the other one is actually pathogenic. They're completely taking advantage of you. And that isn't good, of course. This said, what is one kilogram of microbes doing inside of our guts? Let's find out. One of the things that our gut microbiome is best known for is processing our food. This means digesting things that we wouldn't be able to digest otherwise. This is very cool. And probably the most interesting part is that this relationship is bi-directional. This means that we can influence and shape the types of microbes that we have as much as those microbes can influence us. Let me explain. You inherit your mother's gut microbiome. This means that you were already born with some bacteria inside of your gut. However, as you grow grow and develop and start eating different kinds of food, that microbiome is going to start changing as well. Let's say that if you eat a lot of fries and greasy things, then you're going to be feeding those kinds of bacteria that like processing those types of nutrients. Whereas if you eat, for example, more vegetables and fruits, you're going to be feeding the kinds of bacteria that like processing vitamins and minerals more than carbohydrates. Now the most mind-blowing part is that if you already have, let's say, bacteria that like eating sugars, processing them and doing things with sugar, then they're going to make sure that your brain tells you, your conscious self, to keep eating sugars. In other words, if you have the types of microorganisms that like processing sugars, those can actually communicate with your brain and tell your brain to keep on eating more sugars. Still not mind blown by these facts? Well, there was actually a study done with more than 12,000 people that demonstrated that if these microbes can be passed from one person to the other, then if you are next or normally spend time with a person who's obese, for example, and their microbiome is composed of bacteria that like eating unhealthy things, and if they pass those bacteria to you, those microbes to you, then you have 57% more probabilities of becoming obese too. The second reason why we should all be mind blown by these microbes is because, as I was mentioning before, they can communicate with our brains. The way they do this is by diffusing some compounds and metabolites across the digestive wall, which communicate with the vagal nerves. And the vagal nerves are basically part of our vagus nerve, which is the largest brain inside of our bodies. And the vagus nerve communicates with our brain. So even though it is not a direct communication, it's been proven that the perturbation of this channel could actually be part of the cause of some neurodegenerative diseases such as schizophrenia, autism, or even depression. Still not surprised? Well, here's another fun fact. Serotonin is the hormone of happiness. And you know what else? 90% of it is produced by our gut microbiome. 
Another thing that these microbes could be doing to us could actually be very beneficial. Again, we all know now how important our immune system is, and we've actually found out that our microbes produce short chain fatty acids, which can even help in the differentiation of some cells, such as T cells, which help fight pathogens. Finally, one of the implications that I find the most interesting is sleep. How our gut microbiome could actually have a correlation with how well we sleep, how efficiently, and how long. Actually, there isn't a lot of research into this specific topic, however, one study found out that there is a positive correlation between the diversity of our microbiome, meaning how many different types of microorganisms there are, and how well we sleep in both efficiency and length. This said, what does synthetic biology have to do in all of this? Well, as you may already know, synthetic biology is this intersection between engineering and biology. It looks to standardize life by, for example, doing mathematical modeling to know how would reactions happen inside of a certain organism, or designing genetic circuits in which we know what each component does. And of course, there are easier ways to impact our gut microbiome, but they are not so advanced for the 21st century, I'd say one of them is even a fecal transplant. Fortunately, we have found better ways to do this. Living medicines are basically organisms such as human cells or bacteria that have been genetically engineered in order to deliver a therapeutic agent into a host. Two of the reasons why they're called living is one, because they are made up of living things, as I was saying, bacteria or human cells, and the other one is because they are actually smart, they can react to their environment. And of course, this depends on how we design those genetic circuits, but they can overall do what a pill can't. They can liberate the therapeutic agent in the precise time, in the precise place. One of the disadvantages of them is that we, of course, can't be 100% of all the conditions that get involved when working with living organisms, such as external conditions like what we may be eating, or internal conditions like how our body reacts to how we eat, for example. Another one is that we can't be sure of how these bacteria, for example, may be interacting with our already existing gut microbiome, microbiota. We can't know if those bacteria are going to override the other ones and are going to completely colonize our colon, or if they're just going to stay there for a while. We can't know if when they're finally liberated of our bodies, they are going to contaminate the environment, and we can't just know what they're going to do. This is why we are looking to implement some kill switches, which basically make the bacteria, in this case, dependent of the host and can only survive when it is in the host. Let's get into some FAQs. Number one, how do we make sure that the therapeutic agent is going to be released at the right place at the right time? Well, the answer to this is basically genetics. The first one is promoter. So we are going to use a promoter that is dependent on some other condition to activate the transcription of the gene of our interest. The second one is a ribosome binding site, which is basically in charge of the recruitment of a ribosome when it comes the time to produce a protein. Second frequently asked question is, what type of bacteria do we use and why? Well, it depends on the thing that you want to do, what your target is, the organism that you're going to be working with. For example, we use model organisms before doing clinical trials in humans, so it really depends. One example of a bacteria that has been used for a long time in the food industry is the lactic acid bacteria, the LAB, but there are many others for sure. And the third question is, how do we introduce these living medicines into a human body, for example? Well, there are again different types of delivery, however, it, each one of them depends on what our target is. Well, if we wanted to target a cancer, we would use an intratumoral approach, whereas if we want to impact the gut microbiome, we would use an oral mode of delivery, and we can also get to other types of our body through the bloodstream, so that would be another option. If you've watched some other of my videos, you know that I love looking into some companies in the field, and one of them in this case is Synlogic. And this is a company that basically produces living medicines for, for rare metabolic disorders, and they have been also recently looking into COVID-19 vaccines as well as cancer treatments. 
the cool thing about them is that they're already in clinical trials and they're looking to scale their living medicines by partnering with the billion dollar company which is Ginkgo, a synthetic biology platform which will produce the biotechnological products that they need. To wrap this video up, I'd like to mention some of the limitations that I've found in the field while doing my research. And one of them is definitely that we don't understand the gut microbiome as well as we'd like to. This is why we have actually started some projects such as the Human Microbiome Project, which basically aims to map all the microbes that we have inside of our gut. And another limitation is that we can't understand in detail the relation that our microbes have with our brain. We know that it is through the gut microbiome axis, but we haven't looked into specific applications or specific topics such as its relation with sleep or with schizophrenia or with autism. As of synthetic biology, I'd say that we are making a lot of progress in the sense that we have created different biological parts which have allowed us to give more applications to this science and we are bettering the way in which we go through the design build test cycle but I think that this can definitely be improved by using, for example, artificial intelligence or other types of technologies. And lastly, in terms of living medicines themselves, I think that we should definitely look into biocontainment measures so we make sure that they are completely safe for the host and the environment, as well as some other types of deliveries that are that are practical for the host, that we are not only doing injections, but also kind of pills that are also living medicines. Which brings me to the predictions of the future. I think that the future of living medicines is definitely going to play a big role in medicine itself. So I think that we could be seeing living medicines that help us live longer, that can interact in the pathways of longevity, that can help us digest food and therefore can help us live healthier lives, that can help uh, fight obesity, or that can replace sleeping pills such as melatonin which could actually be causing some harm to our intestinal flora itself which doesn't make a lot of sense so overall i think that they're going to greatly impact the way we take pills for example or just the way we take medicine and of course that having mapped our gut microbiome and having understood synthetic biology in a deeper level i think we're going to be able to do amazing things with the combination of these two fields so i really can't can't wait to see what we build with this and I hope you've liked this video that you'll learn something new and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!